Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. You still don't know where we're going tonight, right? Good. Right. First Corinthians 15 is the famous resurrection chapter. You all know First Corinthians 13. And uh, uh, 15 is comparable to it in the sense that it has a, it's a very pivotal chapter on the, uh, on, generally on the resurrection. But it has some definitions in the first four verses. If somebody asks you, what is the gospel? That's a quaint term where we use, we use technical cliches in Christian walk. We speak of the gospel. Well, yes, it means the good news and all that, but what is technically the gospel? What does it include and what does it exclude? The Bible teaches many things that aren't necessarily part of what we would consider the essential kernel. Okay. Well, Paul answers that for us in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and in which ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all, and he's going to mention a few things here, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Anything that you might believe that excludes these three things that he's going to mention is fatal. There are many doctrines and ideas you and I could uh, disagree on and still be in, the, in that forever family. But there are three essential things. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Three things, that he died, not just that he died, but he died for our sins. It was, and he was buried and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, the reason I start here is, we all know this, what I've just gone over I'm sure is familiar to most of you, but you know, what? when Paul talks about the scriptures, what is he talking about? The Old Testament, exactly right. Now the Old Testament uh, uh, describes how Christ is to die for our sins according to the scriptures. Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, virtually every page points in some way, uh, sometimes directly, sometimes more obscurely, but always points to the, that issue. There he was buried. And then he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, as I'm fond of doing, um, challenging you, if we had a little written example, test, where does it say in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ was to raise, rise from the dead on the third day. Turns out there's a handful of places. Uh, some, maybe, yes. Uh, one of the first places is in Genesis 1. That may surprise you. On the third day of creation was when life first appears. Now, you and I would have a tough time seeing that prophetically. But incidentally, some rabbis don't. Because um, uh, just to give you an example of the kind of thinking that can go on, and just to, to deviate for a moment, turn to John chapter 3. Excuse me, um, John chapter 2. Turn to John chapter 2. We have the famous, uh, the first miracle recorded in the Gospel of John is the marriage at Cana, right? And the first phrase of that chapter, 2, is and the third day there was a marriage in Cana. Third day from when? If you read the Gospel of John, you can easily stumble over that. You can either ignore it, as most of us do. We just read on. What does it mean, the third day? You and I would have no way of knowing this, but if you're Jewish, that means it was Tuesday. Why? Because an Orthodox marriage occurs on what day of the week? Tuesday. Why? Because it's the third day. What does that mean? Because if you read the, in Genesis 1, there's always God blessed the day. He saw it was good and he blessed it, right? He doesn't do that on the second day. On the third day, he blesses it twice. So if you go through the, the seven days of Genesis 1, you discover that the second day does not have a blessing. The third day has two blessings. So the third day is a day of double blessings. And if you have a Jewish rabbinical kind of mind, that means if you're going to get married, you get married on Tuesday because you got a double blessing. Okay? Now, and I, 
and I could go in more on that, but just to, not to get into the technicalities there. If you're if you're if you're very very strict in your orientation and very mystical in your view of the scriptures, you can argue that the third day hints at at least uh, uh, as the day of the resurrection. That's a little obscure. Uh, another example is um, that I'm fond of using is the sacrifice of Isaac, Abraham's offering of Isaac, right? We all know the story about Abraham offering Isaac. I'm not going to take you in Genesis 22 tonight, as we'll never get out of here. But I will take you to Hebrews 11, just to take a quick glimpse here. Hebrews, we talked about 1 Corinthians 15. Hebrews 11 is a great faith chapter. And um, when you get to... Um, we all know that Abraham was saved, right? Because he believed God. Yes, but what did he believe about God? That God exists, James says, if you believe that, you know, the devils also believe and tremble. That doesn't help you much. What was it that Abram believed that saved him? The resurrection of Isaac. Abram believed that he was going to be resurrected. When God says, you're going to offer Isaac, he says, fine. That's your problem, God, because you got to, you promised that Isaac's going to have seed. So he'll offer him, but he assumed God would resurrect him. And in Hebrews 11, verse 19, says, according to that, God was able to raise him up even from the dead, which he also received him in a figure. In other words, Abraham, this is speaking of Abraham in this area, uh, from verse 8 through about verse 19. Uh, Abraham had the conviction that Isaac would be raised from the dead. In fact, he names the place where all this occurs in Genesis 22. Jehovah Jireh, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. He knew he was acting out prophecy. And that's a whole other study. You can get the tapes in Genesis 22. Uh, there's another place that's perhaps really obscure, we're dealing in obscure things to get started here tonight, just to scare you all. Um, Genesis um, 8. Remember this guy by the name of Noah, right? Noah built this big barge, right? And you all know the story. But it's a very strange thing. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, the Holy Spirit goes to some length to tell us when the ark landed on dry land to start the new beginning, the new life. Out of the entire old world, God saves eight people. Noah's three sons and their four wives. And uh, so you all know the story. But the interesting thing in verse 4 of chapter 8, the Holy Spirit gives us a technicality that if you're a diligent student of the Scripture, you might puzzle you. Now, most of us, when we read the story, don't you know, you skip over the stuff so it doesn't get in the way of understanding the story. But if you're a nut like I am, you figure that nothing's there without a purpose. This is engineering. My whole theme. I'm not really an evangelist. I'm not really a lot of things. But the one thing I do like to feel, the one thing I hope you carry away from our relationship is an awareness and a respect and an awe for the design of this book. The correction, these 66, 66 books written by 40 guys over thousands of years in which every phrase, every letter, every word is engineered there by the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit says the ark rested on the seventh month of the 17th day of the month in the mountains of Ararat, he said that there is a blessing behind that. Now, you may spend a lifetime chasing it, but the point is there is a blessing behind that if you're diligent. Turns out when, uh, it, uh, it turns out something you, you have a tough time reconstructing, but the seventh month becomes the first month when they leave Egypt. So the ark rested on the 17th month, a uh, 17th day of the month. What's the 14th day of the first month? Passover. When did Christ, when was he crucified? On Passover. When was he raised from the dead? On the 17th. Isn't that interesting? So I could argue, through technicalities, that the prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is here by design. That God knew what he was doing, and that's, it didn't happen to be on the 17th day. God engineered it that way and recorded it. Why? So it fulfills the model. Okay, we're doing pretty good. That's a couple. I'm going to suggest to you that we could go through the life of Joseph, we could go through the passage of the Red Sea and lean on 1 Corinthians 10 and get all of that. But there is another place, and that's, as you can probably guess by now, where we're headed. And that is a guy by the name of Jonah. Okay? How many of you know the story of Jonah and the whale? There is no Jonah and the whale. Ketos is a fish. A fish. Now, everybody that knows about Jonah knows probably the least relevant thing of the whole book. So it's kind of fun to get into this. Um, by the way, while we're in Genesis 8, verse 4 we looked at, verse 8 speaks of a dove, right? The dove was sent, remember Noah sent the dove out, and the dove came back with a branch. The dove was the bearer of good news, right? 
What do you think the name Jonah means? A dove. Okay, so I thought I'd share that with you. Um, this book uh, is a um, much maligned book. And interestingly enough, um, now obviously the cynics and the unbelievers make fun of it. This whole idea of Jonah and the whale, as they say, that's incorrect. The, the Greek word, uh, or the, the word in, in the, in the subject would be ketos, it's, it, it's a fish. Now, if you've got a problem with that, um, you know, it's funny, it's funny. I, I, if I told you, you know, back, it's kind of out of date now, but I remember years ago when the Nautilus submarine went under the ice cap, under the North Pole, over the, you know, through the North, under the ice cap of the North Pole. That was big news. The United States government organized a boat that could have some 70 guys stay under the, under the water for 120 days. Isn't that amazing? Now, the United States government, doing anything is amazing, but <laughs> having, <laughs> organizing a nuclear vessel with its life support systems to carry some, I think I forget the crew, uh, maybe 70 is too large, I can't remember exactly. Whatever, let's take a Polaris. What's it on, uh, that crew may be classified. Let's just say it's on station around the world. Staying underwater. Now, the United States government can do it. Can't, you mean God can't? God can't prepare a fish for one guy three days? Come on, guys. You know, it's interesting. Uh, one, one writer, I obviously, I, you know, I'm reading on this subject, and, and uh, uh, I think it was Feinberg that makes the point kind of interesting. You know, if you take the miracles out of the Bible, you don't have much left. What kind of God would you have left? Interesting thought, isn't it? So, uh, Part of your problem, or our problem, collectively, because we all sometimes have doubts about these things, is to, um, uh, you know, we have a tough time visualizing it. Uh, I think it's important for us, um, you know, I could easily, kind of, I, I could have teased you, I was coming in and said, boy, uh, next time we get together, because it, I think we'll go about, you know, we've got about four chapters here, and we'll probably break it in at least two sessions. Uh, I'll deal with the fish next time, and I'll have absolute proof about Jonah and the big fish. You know, I wonder, what's he up to? And I'd come back with you. I won't do that to you because what I'm really, where I'm really headed is, I think our attitude towards Jonah's fish should be the same as the star of Bethlehem. I'm always fascinated as an astronomer by hobby. I've got books and speculations on conjunctions of this and that and comet and stuff. Star of Bethlehem. Every planetarium show around Christmas always has some goes through the half a dozen different theories. Boy, if there was an explanation for the star of Bethlehem, and we got some real problems because it wasn't a natural phenomenon. And um, so the star of Bethlehem was set up to lead a group of magi. Notice I didn't say three, but anyway, a group of magi uh, because they were watching for four centuries for that sign. Now these guys, uh, the ancient Persians, whatever, they're no dummies. They know the heavens. And if it was some star that was predictable, they wouldn't have been impressed. But this caused, brought their attention to come to Jerusalem. So the point I'm getting at is, is that uh, looking for uh, uh, natural explanations misses the whole point. What's my proof of that? You might turn with me to um, Matthew 12. And, you, and I'm going to suggest that the study of Jonah is going to be far more interesting and important to you and I than a fish story. You know, we could talk apologetically, as they sometimes say, about this and, and uh, 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 so forth. You know, every once in a while, and you've seen, you'll even see this in some books in the book of Jonah, if you, if you collect commentaries like I do and, and uh, dig into this, you'll find every once in a while some guy or some newspaper article will talk about some guy who was swallowed by a whale for 18 hours, and then and they recovered him. And of course, he's in the hospital because he's emaciated, but he's alive, and they bring him back to health. And isn't that a isn't that wonderful that that, that proves the Bible? You know, it's what it could have been. Hey, that's got nothing to do with it. The Bible doesn't need proof of anything. The Bible doesn't need proof of anything. And I uh, like uh, one guy I read says the Bible is like a lion. You just turn it loose, it'll defend itself. <laughs> Love it. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I thought that was kind of cute. I, anyway, uh, Matthew 12, though, and I'm interested in verse 39. Or let's start with verse 38. This is great. Certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, Master, 
we would see a sign from thee. Now, <laughs> this is really pretty funny because he just got through uh, healing people so dramatically they had to ascribe it to Satan and things. I mean, uh, when you get, if you're reading the gospel, when you get to this, it's really pathetic because they've just gone through and they're all upset about these wild things that he's just achieved. But uh, we would see a sign from thee. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Well, this is a very, very key piece of Scripture. Because first of all, you and I can save mountains of library work because we know who wrote Jonah. You can wait through commentators that speculate this, that, and I'll show you a few other things too before we're through. But the point is you and I have a great shortcut to the book of Daniel, the book of Jonah, to mention a couple. Why? Because they're authenticated by the creator of the universe in words we can understand. He says, there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. He wasn't just a wanderer. Or he was a prophet. He had the office of a prophet. His book was in the canon of the Old Testament. It was the scriptures. So they knew Jonah. And he says, there no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Before we're through with our study, I'm going to suggest to you several ways that that relationship is much more complex and illuminating than you would think of at first. He says some other things here. Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. Okay, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Right? Now, that's going to raise all kinds of issues. And sort of let you know up front, I think you don't have to accept what I'm going to say, but I'm going to share with you the belief that Jonah died and was resurrected. We'll examine the text very carefully. It's not necessary to hold that view to understand Jonah and get all the message out of it. But just as an aside, so you at least know where I'm coming from, I personally believe he died and was resurrected because of the way he prays and because of the details we'll see when we get into the text, which we will shortly. There's another issue that comes out of this book of Jonah, and that is that Good Friday is a myth. And I may offend a lot of people here, but I have a view that any tradition of man that's not substantiated clearly in the Scripture is wrong. It doesn't just happen to, might be wrong because it's not, I actually believe it's a form of mischief, if you will, that unless it's in the Scripture, if, it's a, if there's a tradition of the church, any denomination, that isn't supported by Scripture, it's my suspicion that behind it you'll find it's an error. Now, all we know about the crucifixion is it could have been on Friday. Why? Because he was three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, and we know he rose on Sunday. That's not true. I lied to you. Sorry. He rose Saturday night. Not on Easter sunrise. I'm sorry to spoil the fun. And we're going to get into that. We'll get into it now. We'll get into all of that as we get into all of that. Uh, but um, <laughs> for those of you that are really, uh, you know, uh, 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 aren't ready for the iconoclastic kind of things we'll get into, I thought I'd warn you in advance. Um, there's lots of ambiguity about exactly the crucifixions, you know, the uh, the, uh, the details of that week. But the one thing um, that uh, I, I think you'll conclude when we're through is that it couldn't have been Friday. And that raises all kinds of questions. What about the Sabbaths? And why do they think it's Friday? And or how did the church start doing that, et cetera? We'll get into that when the time comes. Um, okay. The book of Jonah 
has many dimensions to it. Yes, it's a fascinating story. You won't believe the attitude of this turkey. God gives him assignment to go east, and he grabs the first sheep he can get his hands on going west. And Jonah was no dummy. He knew the scripture. He knew you can't get away from God. But he's like you and I. Underlying that. We're going to laugh a lot at Jonah. We're going to smile at his headstrong pride, his pout. Uh, but be careful, because there go you and I. And I'm going to suggest that he was backslidden but resurrected. And ultimately fruitful. So take hope in that. Um, the book of Jonah has many dimensions. I'm also going to suggest to you softly, because I'm not sure I'd push it too hard, but there are many scholars that believe the book of Jonah chronicles he's a type of Israel. And we'll suggest some of those notions as we go. Um, the book of Jonah is the great missionary book of the Old Testament. He's the only prophet that was sent to the heathen. And the more Jewish you are, the more you're oriented to the, if I'll call it what I'll call the Jewishness of the Old Testament, the more bizarre that is. Because yes, Israel was to be a witness in all of that, but to have a prophet sent to the largest city in those days, a million inhabitants probably, Nineveh was formidable. And that's strange. Now this isn't just tucked away in the Old Testament to give you a feeling of its importance in the in the field in the in the world of Judaism. It's read on Yom Kippur, the high day of, of the Jewish the seven Mosaic feasts. Yom Kippur, of course, is the is the one of the biggies. And uh, uh, as part of the traditional ceremony of Yom Kippur, the Book of Jonah has a relationship. Amazingly enough, I mean that may, that that comes as a, a you know a, a, that's interesting observation. Okay, um, let's find the book of Jonah. And through mumbling about the background, the rest we'll sort of throw in as we go. Book of Jonah. It's one of 12 books called the Minor Prophets. That terminology is tragic in my mind. You know, we can relate to the Torah, the five books of Moses. We can relate to the poetical books or the writings of different sections. But when we get to the prophets, you have major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And since there's two books for, contributed to there's five books, counting Lamentations with Jeremiah. So you've got four so-called major prophets. And you've got 12 so-called minor prophets. That nomenclature really is sort of more like librarians in the sense that that minor, ma, uh, major and minor has to do with how big the books are. And the major prophets were the largest writings. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. The minor prophets are smaller books. Very short little books. And, uh, but don't misunderstand. Some of your most profound prophecies and insights come out of the so-called minor prophets. A good example is Zechariah. Boy, that's a humdinger. Uh, and a lot of them. So, so Jonah is classed among those. Um, now, we know, just to give you a feeling of timing, uh, you, you could turn to 2 Kings 14. If you turn to the second book of Kings, in the reign, reign of Jeroboam II, we have 2 Kings chapter 14. We just pick up verse 25. That's all we need for our purposes here. He restored the border of Israel from entering the Hamath unto the sea of, uh, of the Arabah, uh, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spoke by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was of gath Hefer. So this is a reference, and you'll see when we open Jonah that the, the same father and same geography obtains here. Um, so Jonah was a prophet that, me, that places him about eight centuries before Christ was born, just to give you a rough, uh, eight, eight, eight century B.C., just to give you a rough feeling for it. Now, there is an interesting thing here. geth Hefer is in the, in the geographic territory assigned in Joshua 19 to the tribe of Zebulun. It's about an hour north of Nazareth, which puts it in what generic area? Galilee. 
And I think it's kind of interesting to look at John chapter 7. We're sort of, we're sort of wandering around. We'll jump in the book here in a minute. But uh, John chapter 7, verse um, 50, uh, 52. He answered and said to him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. They're wrong at least in two places. There are two prophets that arose from Galilee, Jonah and Nahum. Both are out of Galilee. And what's interesting about uh, Jonah and Nahum, not only are they both out of Galilee, they both were assigned a mission relative to Nineveh. Now, uh, Nahum comes at least over a century after Jonah. Jonah is going to be sent to Nineveh. He goes to some extreme lengths to avoid it. God goes to some extreme lengths to make sure he gets the message to Nineveh. And uh, Jonah's big pout is because Nineveh repents. So Jonah's you know, reputation as a prophet is clouded because he predicted judgment and Nineveh repents, so God spares Nineveh. And so Jonah, you'd think he would be pleased... But he isn't. About a century later, 100, 100, 150 years later, Nahum is on the scene and describes the judgment of Nineveh because it, its time is ripe and it is judged. That's much later. That's much later. Okay, back to Jonah, chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. Right up front, makes no apology. We're talking God's word here came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying. His father's name, Amittai, who apparently from, for the, from the king's reference, we know he was also a prophet. But uh, Amittai is a, um, uh, means, by the way, truthful. Truthful. Kind of an interesting name to have. Now, God says to Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh. God is going to say that to Jonah a couple of times here. And uh, before we're all through, hopefully he'll say the same thing to us. But here he's saying to Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Imagine yourself as Jonah. You're Jewish. Boy, the last thing in the world you want any part of is to go to a Gentile city. I mean, that ain't your, that, 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 that's not, not what you'd rather do. Of all the Gentile cities, the one you'd least like to go to is Nineveh, okay? Capital of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, dug up a little background on Nineveh, just to give you a feeling. First mentioned in Genesis 10, verse 11. It's on the eastern bank of the Tigris. It's sort, in a sense, in a broad sense, it's sort of a sister city to Babylon. It's famous, of course, because Sennacherib made it the capital of the Assyrian Empire. It was destroyed by the Medes and Persians in 612 B.C., and that, uh, that's uh, obviously uh, what Nahum was talking about much later. Now, it is the largest city of the ancient world. It's larger than Babylon. Years later, Babylon rises to power, but it never gets to the size of Nineveh. Sixty miles in circumference. That's big. Walls a hundred feet high, and you could race three chariots abreast on the wall. Babylon has a wider wall. You could race, I think uh, there's records that they could race six abreast on the walls of Babylon, but the city itself was not as large as Nineveh. So this is, and they have fifteen hundred towers in the wall that some uh, historians record as high as two hundred feet high. Population is estimated to be somewhere between six hundred thousand to a million. There are reasons to believe there are a million, but they may be slightly exaggerated, so pick your number. So the point is, it's not just a little uh, you know, village. It's a huge, huge place. A couple of other things about it. One of the primary deities they worshipped, one of their idols they worshipped, was the god Dagon. You remember the story of Samson and the Philistines, the same uh, generic uh, uh, form of idol worship. One of the incarnations of Dagon was Onus, O-A-N-N-E-S, if you transliterate it. If you put an I in front of Onus, you have the name of Jonah for the, in the New Testament scriptures. That was the Greek word 
is uh, that close. Now, there, is an, there uh, was an, an Assyrian mound by the name of Nebi Yunus, N-E-B-I-Y-U-N-A-S, two words, which translated means the prophet Jonah. And an archaeologist by the name of Botah connected the name of this mound in Assyrian with Nineveh and excavated and discovered, that's how they discovered the walls of the ancient walls of the old city of Nineveh, was through that connection, just as an interesting little bit of background. Now, so, jo- we're, okay, we're de- we got to verse 2. Jonah has his call. He has his great commission. Go to Nineveh. In verse 2, we find that, find Jonah's response. But, Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Boy, that's dumb. You want to talk about God. How do you get away from him? Fabulous psalm, right? Behold, wherever I go, thou art there. And it's an extreme then portrayed. So Tarshish happens to be to the west. Nineveh is to the east. Jonah goes to the west. Where is Tarshish? Boy, there are a lot of people that wonder where Tarshish was. Herodotus identifies it as Tartessus, which is in the southern part of Spain. That's an ancient Greek historian. He's one of the authorities. He, he would argue that, Tar, uh, that uh, Tarshish was in sp- southern Spain. There were two Phoenician. Bear in mind, this area, Phoenicia, is the major sea power. And by the way, the sailors on the boat that he's going to get on are probably Phoenicians. It's a reasonable uh, uh, speculation. They're obviously very able, and they handle themselves really amazingly well. But the point is, there are two Phoenician smelting centers. The word uh, Tarshish has to do with tin. The two smelting centers, one is in Spain and one is in Sardinia, and they appear on the ancient maps. So there's two possible locations for Tarshish. All kinds of students of prophecy try to make Tarshish Britain because of the young lions in, in Ezekiel. They sort of somehow try to bend things around to make Tarshish uh, somehow related to England because Brit- Britain also is a source of tin, so it's got that going for it. But uh, I understand from my studies so far there is no evidence of that. Lots of wishful speculation because it would fit some neat ideas, but it, there's no evidence of it. So at the moment, we really don't know where Tarshish was. All the candidate locations are, in fact, very substantially west of Israel, on the, presumably on or near the Mediterranean, because there was trade, often mentioned in the Bible, with Tarshish, so uh, for what that's worth. But now, Jonah, I went down to Joppa. Now, Joppa is, the, um, is known to you and I as Joppa, and you can go visit when you visit, when you visit um, um, Israel. It was a harbor um, since the days of Solomon. You find it in Second Chronicles 2.16, but Joppa, as we know it, Joppa, as it's quoted here, are, uh, is a, obviously a major, major seaport at that time. Went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. It's funny if it wasn't so tragic. Can you imagine a guy getting a ship? I just want to get away from the Lord. That's... You're going to note as we go through the text here, there's a lot of going down. Uh, 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 our friend uh, Jonah is, uh, is going down a great deal. He's, uh, he goes down at least four things. He goes down to Jaffa. He goes down to the ship. He's going to go down the sides of the ship. He's going to go down in the gullet of the big fish, and he's going to go down to, quote, the bottom of the mountains, whatever that means, and we'll come to that. So uh, Jonah is on his way down in many ways in one. Where is he going spiritually? Down. Down. Right on. Okay. Now, you and I probably need to identify with, you know, we can can poke fun at Jonah. Boy, is he dumb. He didn't. uh, My suggestion is be very, very careful. It's not very pleasant, but I suspect you and I, if we're honest with ourselves, can identify a lot with Jonah. And it's not unuseful for us to at least think about that a little bit, because Jonah was obviously not doing what he ought to. And uh, 
if I asked for those of you that have always done what the Lord wanted you to do to stay in the room the rest of this leave, we'd be empty in here. Okay, I'd be gone too. So, so we've got to be cautious. The good news is God didn't let go. Now, in this case, he did some rather colorful things, but uh, uh, the, the Lord, uh, Lord his hand, hand is not short. And uh, it's interesting that uh, he brings uh, Jonah to a place of repentance. And indeed, he uh, puts him back on the right track. And even after Jonah performs the mission, he does some really, he has some strange behavior. But uh, that may be for lots of purposes. At least God turns it to his purposes. Um, but we should, so to the extent that we can be indicted with the same brush, take a heart because he is in fact resurrected and so on. So um, let's, not, let's, let's pay close attention to our friend Jonah. Okay, he paid the fare, went down to it to go with him to, into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But, here's a second but. See, but Jonah did this, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was in danger of being broken. Then the mariners were afraid. Now, by the way, before we go any further, let's figure out who these mariners were. We'll, we'll, for lots of reasons, we can assume that they were Phoenicians. In any case, these guys were professionals. They weren't like you and I on a Sunday afternoon, out where they shouldn't be. These guys are professionals. They made their living on the Mediterranean. They knew the Mediterranean. So they, you will see, recognize that this is no ordinary storm. Don't read this and assume, gee, they just got into a bad storm. These guys, the professionals, knew by the way it was behaving, something unique was going on. Now, everybody hangs up on Jonah and the big fish. Let me tell you, this book has at least ten miracles in it. And why you pick on the big fish? Uh, the storm is a miracle. It's miraculous. It's unique. It's not natural. They're going to select Jonah as being guilty by lot. It's a miracle. How did the, you know, the lot fall on Jonah? And he confessed, of course. Okay. When, when, when they finally throw him over, the storm quits. That's a miracle. Storms don't just... That one did. It just stopped. The great fish, of course, not just being prepared for this mission, but being at the right place at the right time. If it hadn't been there, Jonah would have drowned. It's a miracle. I mean, it's more tied up than just the fact that, gee, there's this big fish that came along. The preservation of Jonah in the fish, by whatever view you have of that episode, is, is obviously a miracle. The ejection of Jonah on dry land. He didn't just get rid of him and let him swim to shore. You know, he, he, he ejected him on dry land. Then there's this strange business of the gourd, which is a miracle, as we'll get into, and the worm, and the east wind. To mention nine things, ignoring the biggest miracle of all, and ate the fish, is that a million inhabitants in the city of Nineveh repented. That was the biggest miracle. The most important miracle of the bunch. No one quarrels with that one. You know, it wasn't 10%, 20%, half, 70%. City of Nineveh, the king dumbed down, put on sackcloth and ashes, and they repent to spare the city. That's why Jonah's so upset. He'd gone around and said, 40 days, it's over, guys. And then it's not over because they repent and the Lord spares it. What does he do? He'd sit up on the hill and he pouts. I knew you'd be merciful, Lord. You'll see. It's a, he's a character. So, um, anyway, the mariners, verse 5, the mariners were afraid and cried every man to his God. In other words, they, they were in panic. I mean, this is an extremist. And they cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea. That's desperate. They get paid by cargo. They're dumping the cargo overboard. The liabilities are no different then than now. That's tough stuff. They are in panic. They realize this is serious. They, ca they, ca and they cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten them. But Jonah was gone down to the sides of the ship, and he lay, and he was fast asleep. It's interesting how not only can we sin, but how oblivious we can be to the penalty of the sin on others. 
Interesting situation. Which raises a whole bunch of other things that uh, I won't badger hard, but I'll throw out just for some discussion. Um, can you sin by yourself? I'm fascinated by this term you find in the press, victimless crimes. Um, I'm going to suggest to you that no man can sin by himself. Something is victimless if, you, if there's no one that loves you. There's no such thing as a private sin. I'm going to suggest to you that anything you do that sin is injurious to others. And any example you can think of has to, at least as a minimum, involve those that love you, who loves you the most. God does. Have you injured him with sin? You bet. So I'll just throw that out as some thoughts. We'll come back to some of that. But uh, it's interesting how uh, we often may think that, gee, we have some little indulgence and no one knows it's not a big deal and so forth. Nonsense. Uh, and uh, we're oblivious to those that we injure with our sin. Jonah was gone down on the side of the ship. He lay fast asleep. They're, they're fighting for their lives. He's down there in a nap. Verse 6, the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise. Here's the second, second call. Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that the God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for, though, for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. What a coincidence. Coincidence is not a kosher word, as I pointed out to you. It's interesting that they cast lots. The word in the in the uh, uh, Old Testament is goral, which means small pebble or stone. The Greek word is a die. Plural is dice. Now, it doesn't have to be like the dice you and I know, with the numbers on six sides. But the point is that it's, it's from that cast. That's where the tradition starts of, of a way of. Of, of creating a random event to, to break a tie or to, to make a selection. Uh, this business of um, casting lots, I started to make a list just to be, you know, uh, complete and throw out all this stuff. Uh, Achan, remember the, the judgment of Achan? When he sinned and they cast lots, it fell on him. Jo that's in Joshua 7. The division of land in the book of Joshua is done by lots. Um, Jonathan's trespass in 1 Samuel 14. Um, Aaron, choose the goats, the, the, the two goats, which were in the, in the, in the uh, scapegoat thing, uh, uh, Leviticus 16. The selection of the cities for the Levites was done by Lot, in first, and so forth. And, but it goes on and on and on. I finally just couldn't list them all. Except it's interesting, there's only one case in the New Testament, that's when in, in Acts 1, they cast lots to fill the vacancy implied by Judas, and it fell on Matthias. It's interesting, in the New Testament, there are no examples of casting lots in terms of the evidence of God's, evidence of God's will after the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. So we note that. In fact, the one occasion in the book of Acts which precedes that is generally viewed by most scholars as a colossal failure. They presumed that God would fill the twelve by the lot. He didn't. You never hear about Matthias again. No, no offense to Matthias. He may have had a nice ministry, but he's not recorded. Who was the twelve? Paul. That came later. See? So most, uh, uh, most theologians would argue that while it was a widely practiced style in the Old Testament, in fact, not only practiced, but dignified, if you will, by the Urim and the Thummim. And the Urim and the Thummim, however you pronounce that, is a, is a, is a study in its own right, and I encourage you to dig into this if you have a, a desire to. Basically, the, the high priest had a, uh, an outfit of five colors, which included something that was over his shoulders, sort of like a bib, maybe. They called it the breastplate. And uh, it had a breastplate of five stones, and, or excuse me, 12 uh, stones, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. But it was also designed so it had sort of like a bib or a pocket. And in the pocket were the ermine and the thummim. And scholars have studied the scriptures faithfully to try to find out what it was mechanically. We don't know. And uh, you'll read a lot of books that speculate. Most common speculations, and there's some reasons to infer this, but it's not clear, was that there were two stones, exactly identical, one black and one white. And when someone went to the high priest to resolve an issue, they would consult 
the Urm and the Thummim. The lights and perfections is what I think the terms can be translated to mean. And they would reach in and they would, depending on which one they pulled out, that would be God's will, yes or no. It's like a... Uh, uh, and, and we don't know what they actually were. Um, and there's lots of examples of the use we could go through. I won't derail our study tonight to do that. But it is interesting that in, you might turn with me to Revelation chapter 2 in one of the seven letters of seven churches. In chapter 2, um, verse 17, I think it is. Like all the seven letters close with a particular promise. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to seven churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no one knoweth except he that receiveth it. Some scholars believe that this is an ellipsis, if you will, to the Urim and Thummim. The white stone of the, of the two colors, say white and black. White was the good one. Black was the bad, you know, that's where we get the idea of black ball. You'll hear that expression. And uh, so that's where scholars believe, can't prove, not sure, that the Urim and Thummim were two stones, one black, one white, or one some other color than white. And that notion seems to be confirmed by this allusion uh, uh, in, in the seven letters, seven churches. But in any case, we're not dealing with any of that here. It's just, this is a little, just a little background. Uh, here, these sailors, though, cast lots. And uh, we can infer that that was, a, that was partly an act of desperation, but it was also a procedure that was um, 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 uh, appropriate in those days. It's interesting that God has a... You know, oh, something else you should see about casting lots. You might turn to Proverbs 16.33. I hesitate to do this in a way because I don't want to encourage you doing something that's probably not the right way to get God's will. However, in the Old Testament does happen and um, frequently. And um, in Ch Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. So it's on that kind of an authority in the Old Testament days. You'll find them using this. And uh, I just mentioned that again as background. But again, it's my encouragement to you to that 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 is not the way the Holy Spirit operates in the New Testament. If you're walking by the Spirit, uh, you should have no need for those kind of mechanics. But anyway, um, the lot fell upon Jonah in Jonah chapter one verse eight. They came and then said they unto him, "Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation?" And from where comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? These guys got right to, you know, there's the, there's the court of inquiry. And they'd like to know just a few things here. What's your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? What, what people are you? They said to them, I am a Hebrew. They must have gasped. Because they knew what a Hebrew was. And the Hebrew was the term they used to others. It means crossed over the river and all that. You know that stuff. That was, the, that was the external way of describing what you and I would call an Israelite. But in any case, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who hath made the sea and the dry land. He's speaking here in the Elohim sense. By the way, if you really get into the language here, he uses, Jehovah is the covenant name of the peculiar relationship God has with Israel. Elohim is the creator, and that's the term he's using to him, them here. You'll find that word used differently throughout the book, depending on which perspective you use. But here he's speaking of a God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Kind of a relevant dimension. Here's the where they are right now. Then were the men exceedingly afraid. How fascinating it is that these heathen, heathen sailors have more sensitivity to the predicament that Jonah's in than Jonah did. Can you imagine Jonah saying, I was just trying to get away from him? the God of the universe, by taking your ship? Right. The men were exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. I'd just love to hear that conversation. Huh? Then said they unto him, What shall we do for thee, that the sea may be made come to us, unto us? 
for the sea raged and was tempestuous. Now it's interesting what happens now. Jonah's coming around, sort of. And he said to them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm for you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Well, good for you, Jonah. He fesses up. It's very interesting that Jonah doesn't just jump off the ship. It's going to be important for our purposes that he doesn't jump. He makes them throw him. A little subtly, but I want you to be sensitive as we go here. This thing's going to get interesting here. He said to them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. Why bother, guys? I can step up on the rail here and spare you all this. If I, you know, I'm gone, I'm out of here. And the sea will come. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, now notice these men. Interesting. These men rode hard to bring her to land. They don't throw them off then. Fine guy. They're going to bust their pick to somehow save this thing. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring her to land, but they could not, for the sea raged and was tempestuous against them. Two things they did. They got rid of the baggage, and they worked their fannies off. Did either one avail anything? Remember that. That's the path of religion in whatever shape and size, whatever denomination. Gee, if you unload enough baggage, if you deny yourself enough, you can make it wrong. Wrong. Can you do works? No. There's a verse you all know. Isaiah 64, 6. Just let's pause and detour here. Isaiah 64, 6. Isaiah gives us a very colorful description of something you and I ought to know. Isaiah 64, 6. You should mark it in your Bibles. You should remember this. For we are all as unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. We all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. The King James translators are being very polite to you. Because the King James has a certain majestic quality, and it's preserved by many things they did, one of which was to mistranslate verse 6. It's not filthy rags, girls. It's used menstrual cloths. Is that more graphic? I don't want to offend anyone here, but that's faithful to the text. Isaiah is very articulate. But for our purposes, we don't have to get quite that offensive. We'll stick with filthy rags. It's a little more euphemistic, but it's still pretty bad, huh? I want you to notice something here. I've read this hundreds of times and missed something. It doesn't say our sins are as filthy rags. It says, what is as filthy rags? Our righteousness. You hear it? Whatever you and I might do, give your goods to feed the poor. Commit your life to charity work. Put it, fill in that blank with whatever you like. It will not do anything for your righteousness. If you're in Him and if you're saved, and if you're doing it in response to a call of the Holy Spirit, different ballgame. That's a different subject altogether. But can doing anything add one iota to what Jesus Christ has done for you? No. It has pleased God to provide you a salvation that's 100, not 99, 100% completed by His Son, Jesus Christ. For you to aspire to, add anything to it is blasphemy. Tough concept, but important fundamental concept. And it's interesting that that concept is right here in um, Jonah. 
These sailors were in trouble. They dumped over all their baggage, didn't help. They rowed with all they had to try to get it to shore, couldn't do it. Okay? So they finally come to verse 14 of chapter 1. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord, Oh, really? These Phoenician sailors cried to whom? To Elohim. Not the God of the Phoenicians, the God of Jonah. Why? He's very visible. And said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. That's strange. I thought he wasn't innocent. I thought he was guilty, and that's why the storm is there. So why are they saying it this way? Let me suggest to you there's probably several reasons, but the one that intrigues me the most is that it's a type. Who is Jonah a type of? Jesus Christ. How do I know that? From Matthew 12. His three days and three nights in the belly of the fish was pointed to by Jesus Christ as being a foreshadowing of another who would spend three days and three nights in a belly, belly of the earth. And it's interesting here that this whole stage you get sets, that all what man could do, all the baggage they dump over, all the hard work they might put, will not avail. What do they do instead? They offer an innocent life. Now, I'm not drawing that you could uh, trouble with any type or analogy or model, is you can overplay it. I'm not suggesting that Jonah was sin-free as Christ was. Obviously not. But the type fits, though, doesn't it? In, the, in, in a model sense, in, in an allegorical sense. Jonah is here deemed as innocent blood. What are they going to do? They're going to cast him over. He is offered. Jonah is offered. Jesus Christ is offered. Jonah didn't kill himself. He didn't jump over the rail into the ocean. He had them throw him over. In whose hands? Man's hands. Who crucified Jesus Christ? The hands of man. Paul talks about that, preaches from it. Let us not perish for this man's life. Let not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Boy, that must have affected those Phoenician sailors. Shook to their roots by the storm, and now they do this, and the storm stops. It's my suspicion, just my own inference, that the stopping of the storm was just as miraculous in its execution, especially, as the storm coming up in the first place. How do I know that? From verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Praise God. These Gentile sailors, I assume they were Phoenicians, show class here. They dealt with it. The questions were good. When they found out what was going on, they did the natural thing at first. But when it's all over, they give thanks. They made sacrifices and they vowed vows. I think that's... And by the way, the men of Nineveh are going to do the same thing before this is all over. Now, we get to the problem verse for most people. Now, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. A little last verse of, of, of uh, chapter 1. It's one of these times I feel like closing books. Say any questions? You know? Okay. Okay. Um, now, when did he prepare the great fish? There's some rabbinical traditions that believe that this fish was prepared at the creation. Cute idea, typical rabbi, rabbinical kind of outlook. Fine, have no problem with it. I personally suspect that uh, it may have been a special mission. Maybe that maybe there's a whole species of fish that perpetuate itself from creation on just for this mission. Wouldn't surprise me at all. Was it something that was prepared for the occasion? Have no idea. None of those things give me any trouble. 
But there is a dimension to this that's important. That it is a miracle. God provided this fish. I'm going to suggest to you, because of Matthew 12, 38 and 39, that we read when we started, that your belief in the fish is as critical as your belief in the gospel. Because Jesus Christ has identified himself with the reality, the fact of verse 17 of chapter 1. And you and I, if I should ask a show of hands, and I won't, so I won't embarrass you, how many of you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior? I'd probably see most of them. Those that didn't would put it up just out of social pressure. Okay. <laughs> if I asked you before we started and got into all this, how many of you are really sure of the Jonah and the big fish? I suspect I'd get less than 100% of your hands up. If you have a problem with Jonah and the big fish, it's because you haven't thought it through. It's just, it's linked inextricably with the claims of Christ in Matthew 12 and elsewhere. So you might want to think about that, the story of Jonah. I also suggest to you that if I could bring up some newspaper clippings or an article from some scientific journal that, quote, proved the story of Jonah, that would be, that's destructive, that's useless. Some very misguided Christian writers have tried to bend that around, and I think that's missing the whole point, the whole point. There was nothing natural about Jesus Christ being raised from the dead in, in, near Jerusalem, you know, 1900 and some odd years ago. Nothing natural at all. It was one of the, it's, the, it's probably the greatest miracle that, uh, of, of, of all of them. There's nothing natural about Jonah and the big fish. Any attempt to make it look that way misses the whole point. Now, uh, so, it, so, so the fish swallowed up Jonah. He is in the fish's gullet. The digestive juices and whatever are at work. There's nothing at all, uh, anything short of miraculous, that he, he survived the three days and three nights and is coughed up on dry land in a condition to get on his feet and go preach at Nineveh. He didn't recover under special intensive care. He wasn't under a doctor's orders for six weeks or whatever. He was on his way to Nineveh. And um, so this whole thing, there's no way you can bend around saying, gee, well, this is just a, an extension of something you and I might witness uh, you know, in, in the natural world. No way. Now, um, we'll just keep moving here. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. He's not in some air chamber in a whale. There's all kinds of theories that this, that this can easily be dismissed. Jonah is able to pray. He prayed out of the fish's belly. And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of... What does your Bible say? Sheol. Sheol. Good. It's Sheol. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this in a minute, but it's out of the belly of Sheol, um, I cried, and thou heardest my voice. He obviously is praying when he's there. He's recording this after the fact, looking back, but he does require it. Now, this whole thing um, gets raised to some other word, word issues. You do not have to believe what I'm about to share with you because it is, um, um, uh, well, it's, just not, it's not essential, I don't think. But you should just understand, I personally believe that we're dealing with, uh, I think the degree to which God has modeled the resurrection of Jesus Christ here may be more extreme than most of us recognize. Most of us assumed, as we read this, I think, that Jonah was in the belly of the fish, and God he was miraculously preserved. And when the time came, he was cast out on the land, and that's perfect. I don't think there's any problem with that, but if we go to the text more carefully, there's a couple of things. He says, um, he cried out of the fish's belly, right? The word in verse 1 is miach, which means belly, like an abdomen. Okay? The word in verse 2 called belly is baton, which means a hollow place. A hollow place. So if you were going to try to translate this a little more accurately, 
Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's abdomen and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction of the Lord, and he heard me out of the hollow place of Sheol I cried, and thou heardest my voice. Now, this gets into a whole side study that we could get into, um, because it may be very relevant to really understand, if not what happened to Jonah, a little bit more what happened to, to, to the Lord. What I think we'll do, let's, let's read through chapter 2 and then take a little detour. Out of the, out of the uh, hollow place of Sheol, I cried, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thine holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Well, there's nothing allegorical here. This is, you can almost taste the salt water. I mean, it's... I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. That's an interesting expression. We'll come back to that too. The earth with its bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee and into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that which I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So Jonah comes to the full realization, the climactic phrase of salvation is of the Lord. A couple of things here, a lot of things here, actually. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Sheol. The, uh, the, 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 um, The word hell appears 53 times in our Bibles, 32 times in the Old Testament, 21 in the New Testament, and it is an unfortunate translation of any of three words. In the Old Testament, you encounter the word Sheol, meaning the abode of the dead, sometimes called the grave. But it's not grave in a physical sense, it's a deeper sense than that, but it's the abode of the dead. The equivalent word in the New Testament is Hades. Same concept. Hades is perhaps more frequent in our English literature, but it's also misunderstood. It gets confused with because the word hell and Hades are used as synonyms in English literature. What most of us, when we use the word hell, may really be referring to is Gehenna. Hades and Gehenna are two. In the Greek, in the New Testament, there's a distinction between Hades and Gehenna. Hades is equivalent to the Old Testament term Sheol, the abode of the dead. Gehenna is a place that was prepared for whom? The devil and his angels. That's for whom it was designed. It shows up in Revelation, and one of the climaxes of God's redemption is to take Hades and throw it into Gehenna. Now, this is, I think, to, to, uh, an appropriate place to uh, turn to Luke 16. So let's pause and uh, turn to Luke chapter 16. We could spend a lot of time in many Bible uh, passages, but one of the richest places to explore this area is in Luke 16. And there we have, from verse 19 to the end, 
one of the most important insights that the New Testament has to offer into the mysteries of what, of, of what happens after death. The first point I'd like to make is this is not a parable. Don't let anyone talk to you about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Parables are all, always clearly parables. People do not have names in parables. This is not a parable. It's not an allegory. It's not some kind of um, object lesson. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. That's your tip-off right there. This is not a parable. The Lord Jesus Christ is sharing with his disciples some background, tangible, direct background. We're not speaking allegorically. A certain rich man clothed in purple and fine linen who fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now the contrast here is obviously very deliberate. The rich man and Lazarus are as far apart in a sense as you can find. Verse 22, it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, or Sheol, if you're in the Hebrew, in Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Boy, there's a lot implied here. Abraham is described in the scripture as the father of the faithful. I don't believe that this is any basis to assume that Adam and others are not there, but the domain, the community we're dealing with, is described here as being in Abraham's bosom, that is, in his intimacy. So this is, we're going to discover that Hades, or Sheol, is divided into two compartments. We're going to suddenly, clearly, Lazarus is in the good part. He's with Abraham. The rich man not because he was rich, but he was unsaved for whatever reasons. He is in the undesirable part, the part that we associate with Dante's Inferno or all these literary allusions to what you and I incorrectly might refer to as, well, in the the Gehenna sense. It's hell in the the more classical uh, use of the word. So the rich man cried, and uh, uh, first of all, the the rich man, uh, he's in torment. It's interesting. We learn a lot here that's a little surprising. First of all, he's in torment. And the more you think about this, that's surprising because you normally associate that with the end, with Gehenna. No, he's in torment already. Secondly, he sees Abraham. Somehow, he is aware of the alternative. You see, he's not alone in some awful place. He is in a condition somehow. He's in some kind of hyperspace, obviously, but he he is aware of the the other place because he sees Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom, in Abraham's bosom. So the rich man is aware of what's going on on the other side. That's strange, isn't it? And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they who would pass from here to you cannot. Those that would pass can't. Somehow, these things are designed so that there's an awareness crosswise, but there's no travel, there's no change, there's no ability to trans, uh, uh, trans, uh, uh, go across the, uh, the gulf. 
neither can they pass to us that would come from there. Can't cross over. No, it gets interesting. And then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he might testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. In other words, the rich man saying, okay, if you can't help me, send Lazarus back and talk to my five brothers so that they will understand and not be the victim of my fate. That's really what he's saying. Abram saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto him from the dead, they will repent. He said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one of them rose from the dead. That ends our Lord's recital. It's fascinating that, in fact, the Lord did raise one from the dead by the name of Lazarus. No connection other than the coincidence of the name. And what did they do with Lazarus? They plotted to kill him. Couldn't have him walking around. What a testimony. There's a lot going on here. Um, There's also another issue There is a part of the netherworld, or whatever you want to call this domain we're dealing with here, that shows up in the Bible called the abuso, the abyss in the English. In one place, in Peter, it's called Tartarus, um, where even Homer and others use that phrase for the bottomless pit. The abuso is the bottomless pit. We find it shows up in the book of Revelation. It shows up a number of places. Now, that leads to a classic child's riddle. Let me share that with you. The riddle goes something along these lines. There are some hunters in a camp, and they go 10 miles south, and they find bear tracks. They track the bear 25 miles to the west, where they catch the bear and shoot him. Then they drag him 10 miles to the north, back to camp, where they skin him and eat him. Question is, what color was the bear? Answer has to be white, because the only place you can go south, west, and then north, and end up where you started with is, of course, at the pole. So it's a silly little riddle. But it makes a point. At the North Pole, all directions are south, right? At the South Pole, all directions are north. If I'm going to deal with the concept of the bottomless pit, You can speak that, you can use that just if you like as a poetical phrase, if you like, as a pit with no bottom. But there is only one place that the bottomless pit can be located. Center of the earth, exactly right. Is that the same? If you you put a sphere at the center of the earth, it has no bottom. It's bottomless at the point, you, you follow by analogy the concept. Now, Is there a difference between Hades and Gehenna? Absolutely. Where is Hades? In the belly of the earth. How do I know? Because Jesus told me that in Matthew 12. Where did the Son of Man spend three days and three nights? In the belly of the earth. There is a portion of that, not necessarily where he was, there's a portion of that in the Abuso that's literally at the center of the earth. Now, Gee, that might be figurative language. It could be. I won't deny that. That would be fair. Except I don't believe it is. I believe it's very literal. You're talking about Chuck Missler, an engineer by background, a technician. All my life I've been a technologist. You can't be serious. Yes, I am. I really believe in the geocentric Hades. Well, where's Gehenna in the outer darkness? Hades and Gehenna are as far apart as you can describe. Hades, or Sheol, is in the belly of the earth. What's my authority? Jesus Christ. Jonah and also Jesus Christ. Both are described that way. That's why they also use the expression, the bottom of the mountains, which were regarded as being you know, deep in the earth. That was the way they conceived the mountains. Where's Gehenna? Jesus Christ tells us where Gehenna is. They will be cast where? Into the outer darkness. So it's 
out in the extremes of space somewhere. If we can use, and again, it may be analogous in terms of hyperspace. So I won't get into that one tonight. But that now that, that leads to then a whole bunch of other issues. Up until the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, Hades had, as it's described in Luke 16, two compartments. If you died under the right conditions, you would be in Abraham's bosom. If you didn't, you would be in the other place awaiting some other things yet to happen that Revelation talks about in Revelation 20. What happened when Jesus Christ was crucified and, and then buried? He descended into Hades. What for? To preach to them and announce their uh, uh, redemption. Now, this gets into a... Um, oh boy, let's see. One other thing. Turn with me to Numbers 16. You may recall from our study of Numbers the incident of Korah's rebellion. Right? You recall when Edward G. Robinson was acting up and all that happened? Yeah. Okay. You may also remember what happened in, in, in uh, verse 31. It came to pass, Numbers, 30, uh, Numbers 16, verse 31 through the end, a few verses here. It came to pass as he had finished speaking all these words that the ground split open and, that was under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained to Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into where? Sheol. Not the pit. Sheol. And the earth closed up, uh, closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. And all, uh, and all Israel that was around about them fled at the cry of them for they said, lest the earth swallow them up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Played rough. But again, it's another suggestion that this business of Sheol isn't a figurative or poetic, poetic place. It's, uh, down. All right. Now, okay. The question is, um, why, if you die now, where would you be in the presence of the Lord? You would not go to Sheol or Hades, even the good side. You follow me? You would be with the Lord. If that's the, if that's the case, why did the Old Testament people who died that were saved go to the good part of Hades? And the answer to that has all to do with two things. The nature of God and the fact of sin. The nature of God and the fact of sin. Until sin is dealt with, there's a problem. The problem was solved at Calvary. The Lord Jesus Christ dealt with, gave God a way of dealing with, if you will, sin. And um, I think I've got time to squeeze in one more aspect of this before we break for next time. Turn with me to Colossians. Chapter 2. Paul writes to the Colossians in verse 14. Well, let's pick at verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and circumcision of your flesh hath made a uh, have he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took us, took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. What Paul is using a phrase here you and I are not familiar with. The handwriting of the ordinances that was against us. The way that could be more properly translated is the certificate of debt. We have, you and I have a certificate of debt. In the old world, the Roman and Greek world, if you were convicted of a crime and, and, and sentenced, the court, you were said to have a debt to society, and they actually had a certificate of debt that you owed, let's assume you were sentenced for five years in prison. They drew up a document that was your certificate of debt, and you owed society, the Roman government or the Greek, whichever, uh, five years of your life. So they put you in prison, and the jailer kept his records, your certificate of debt. 
And every time you um, served a year, it would be annotated. You now only owed them four. You paid one, you owe them four more. If you escaped, who do you think paid off what was left? The jailer. That's why when the prison was open and Paul, he was ready to kill himself because no way could he. And he said, don't go, we're still here. And he was blown away. They didn't leave even though the angel had opened all the gates. So, so, but the point is, that's, that's a little background. When you finally did your five years, say, in my analogy here, they would take the certificate of debt and right across it, paid in full. Roll it up and hand it to you. And you left. You paid your debt to society. That's where that expression comes from, from that old practice of the certificate of debt. And that was their approach to avoiding double jeopardy. If somebody ever accused you, didn't you such and such? No, I paid my debt to society. Here's my certificate of debt. And across it was right, written, paid in full. It wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek. Totelestai, paid in full. Jesus Christ, as you hung on the cross, what was the last thing he said? Totelestai. Translated in our English, it is finished. Equivalent phrase, paid in full. He paid it all. And that's why... He could visit Sheol and take his own out of there because the sin question had been dealt with definitively according to the plan that God had set up with the Son before the creation of the world. Adam's sin did not surprise him. He knew it was going to happen. He provided a redemption as a mechanism to demonstrate infinite love. Now, a couple of last thoughts, and then we'll break for next week. Jonah knew all this. Jonah was called to go to Nineveh and get them to repent. Why? To avoid the fate that's described in Luke 16 to us in the New Testament. One of the problems you and I have as we go home tonight is do we really believe that there is a Hades. Do we really understand that unless somebody is in Christ, they are destined, they have a destiny of doom? You know, we don't emphasize that much in our thinking, in our, in our biblical orientation. But it's, cru it's crucial. Not just for you and I to make sure we're saved, but do you have a burden for those that you love? that arises from the reality of the destiny they have. One of the problems Jonah had is he should have been rejoicing that Nineveh repented, not be upset about it. He should have welcomed the call into that mission field. But he didn't. And before we get too critical of Jonah, let's examine our own lives. Do we, first of all, really understand that which Christ has redeemed us from? And if not, let's understand that. Let's study and find out about that. Because in him, we, have an, we, we focus on the positives. We generally don't focus on the reality of what he has avoided for us. And if that's the case, do we have a real passion, a burden for others who in their blindness and their darkness do not understand what the, the real light of the gospel? Because if we feel that way, we're in the same shoes Jonah was. We may not be kidding a ship going to Tarshish, but we're doing the same thing in our lives. Avoiding the issue, hoping it'll go away. Maybe somebody else will go to Nineveh. I don't want to. It's not convenient right now. Let's stand for a closing word. We're just getting into this. Uh, there's some other things that are going to start to emerge out of Jonah that'll be a surprise, but we'll save something for next time. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer.